Welcome to the StoryCraft Cafe. Come in, grab a cup of your favorite beverage, and get ready to join the storytelling conversation. StoryCraft Cafe is brought to you by Dabble, the ultimate cloud-based fiction writing software. Here we're going to bring together storytellers from all walks to encourage and empower you to craft your best story. Well, welcome into the StoryCraft Cafe. I am your host, Hank Garner, and today I am super excited to have Claire McHugh on the show with us. Uh, I got to chat with Claire about two and a half or three years ago when her first book came out, and today we are here to talk about The Romanov Brides. Her brand new novel comes out in just a couple of weeks from now. Um, I haven't done the exact math. Is it? I think it's two weeks from today, isn't it, Claire? Today's yes, Tuesday. Yes, exactly. Book two releases days, are two usually two. Yeah. The Romanov Brides, a novel of the last Tsarina and her sisters. What an epic, uh, and I know that word gets overused today, but what an epic adventure we go on with this book. Claire, what an amazing accomplishment. I absolutely loved it uh, from the first chapter. This is is one of those stories that you just fall into and you don't want to crawl out of. And uh, <laughs> I absolutely loved it. Um, welcome to the show. Thank you, Hank. And thank you for your enthusiasm about this, my sophomore effort. <laughs> well, your first book, um, and I'm blanking on the title, but it's, it's called uh, A Most English Princess. A Most English Princess. Thank you. Um, was... Uh, you know, of particular interest um, as as uh, English history is, um, you know, in this kind of strange way to Americans where a lot of us feel like we're rooted, um, you know, because a lot of us have English heritage, you know, if we go back several centuries, we feel a, you know, a strange connection to our past, but yet we are, you know, kind of the, uh, the outcast cousins that <laughs> you know, live across the pond. Um, so, but, it, you know, the, there's this fascination. Well, you know, also with some interesting news that's happened over the last couple of years. A lot of us are turning our gaze toward Russia and, um, you know, the interesting history that is um, kind of wrapped around Russia. And um, it, it's this is such a timely novel. And I know that this novel, um, you know, it, it's it's so interesting to see when a book comes out and it's so timely and you really get to peel back the layers and see things that are similar to what's happening in the world today. Yes, and, yes. You, and you just know that there was no way you could have <laughs> predicted this, you know, so. So tell, no, tell us what. No. <laughs> yeah, so, so how has life been from the first novel releasing to now? Well, I was very gratified that the first novel, which really came out of a very, very um, eccentric interest of mine, which was the role that the British royal family played in the unification, the original unification of Germany, which is a really academic subject, right? And I wrote my novel about Vicky, Queen Victoria's daughter, uh, best known really in the Western world as the mother of the Kaiser. I wrote about her efforts um, to make Germany in the 1870s and 80s be like Britain, a very benign and, and uh, constitutional monarchy. And she went head to head with Bismarck, this young princess. She lost. Bismarck won. And the nature of the unification of Germany the first time was quite militaristic. And we saw how that ram the ramifications of that in the 20th century. So my first book was you know, it was it was pretty historical for a historical novel and it did quite well. But I also wanted to tell a story the next time that stayed true to my interest in European history of the last years of the 19th century and the early years of the 20th century. That's my period. I wanted to stay true and go back to that period and to the extended family of of Queen Victoria. But I wanted to tell a more romantic story. People like romance. I like romance. So I. Um, I landed upon the idea of doing a novel about the princesses of Hesse. Uh, Alexandra, Alex, as she was called in the family, is the best known because she's the last Tsarina. And she was the one who was killed with her husband, Nikki, in the basement in Ekaterinburg. 
But how did their story story start? I thought that people know a lot about how it ended, but not the romantic way it started. And the more I looked into it, the more I saw that there were parallels with my first book. This is a personal story that also has huge political implications and reverberates right down to the current day. So that's that's turns out to be my thing. (laughs) So I did it again. Um, I, I meant to ask you a question a minute ago, and I'm going to go ahead and ask that to you now, but we got so excited talking about the new book. Um, have you ever, and, and just to kind of recap what we talked about last time, you uh, worked in journalism and in magazine editing and this whole world before uh, tackling fiction. And um, in in your previous work or in your novelist work, have you ever been given a piece of advice that you look back on and say, oh, that was such a uh, a jewel of advice that I, I, I hold on to and it has served me well? Or have you been given a piece of advice that was so terrible um, you're just happy to this day that you didn't take it or regret taking? <laughs> That's a terrific <laughs> question, Hank. I. um my new life as a novelist does have echoes in my old not old world of being uh, a newspaper reporter, um, a magazine writer, and then an editor. And I had an editor when I was a young woman, 28 or 29, a really uh, clever man called John Heilpern. And he was one of my editors at a publication called the New York Observer, a newspaper. And I told John one day how I was in despair because I was never going to be a great writer. And it, all my efforts would be for nothing. <laughs> it was a bad day. He said to me, oh, no, 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 no. The most important thing about becoming a good writer is really wanting to be good. That is 90% of it. Once you've decided, oh, I want to be good, um, then you can get on with it. But if you if if you if it's not something that you're really passionate about, it's really hard to turn up at the desk every day. And um, he inspired me to be a better magazine and newspaper writer. And I remember he's died now. I remember him when I sit down and I look at the, what I wrote yesterday and said, not very good. And I think, no, 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 I, I want to be better. I want to be good. I want to make this better. So let's get on with it. And that kind of that framework really works for me. I also think I have to work like lots of other people with a piece of advice that my mother gave me, which is comparisons are invidious. If you compare yourself to what happens, how other people's careers go and what other people write, you're, and what kind of success they get, you're, you're, this is a, this is a formula for um, discouragement and a distraction. Um, writing is something that the person you're competing against is yourself and compare your work to what you did previously borrow from other people, see why their work, why their work is popular, why people like it, see what you can steal and then um, do it your own way. Take what they've done and put your own twist on it. So those two two pieces of advice are fantastic. Um, If I thought about bad advice, it would be the devil on my um, shoulder. Sometimes it says, this is a waste of time. (laughs) Don't listen to that devil. (laughs) If you're committed to doing uh, to finishing books. Right. Um, that, uh, th- that was fantastic advice that, that you, uh, talked about there in the first part of your answer, um, which kind of brings me to, um, I, maybe a, a sort of niggling, uh, esoteric question, but do you believe that writers are born with the storytelling gene or a gift? Or do you think that writing is something that is earned, that is uh, a learned uh, skill? Um, You know, and maybe like some people who are natural uh, musicians who can play by ear and just hear a melody and can reproduce it. um, And compared with other people that have to study and really learn the ins and outs of music, do you you feel like writing is, uh, where do you think it falls on that spectrum? I think some people are very good at it naturally, yeah. um, but most people, and I include myself there, have to work very hard um, to get better. Um, and um, again, it starts with a desire to do well and also 
um, to have been well taught by people. It helps to be well taught by people who are good critics of, of literature. Um, I think a, a, an excellent education, which I fear lots of people don't get anymore, um, four years of high school English, um, really helps is the foundation, uh, for good writing and then lots of practice. Um, but like everything, you know, like acting, like music, like cooking, some people just have this kind of natural knack for it. Um, but anyone, (laughs) most people who really want to write well, can get better and get uh, to to a pretty good level. Gotcha. Um, you said that uh, earlier that kind of your wheelhouse, your preferred uh, place to write about is or, or time is late nineteenth century, early twentieth century. That time period is so replete with. Um, uh, you know, from societal upheavals to um, political changes and, you know, uh, so much of Europe has was shuffled around and shifted in, in America. We had the Industrial Revolution that was kicking off and, you know, changing the lives of, of nearly everyone in the uh, in the population as a result. Um, and, you know, as a result of that political changes and you know, that our our whole world was just reshaped by so many things in, in that, I don't know, 50 year period, if you want to kind of block that off or whatever. Um, what is it about that time period that fascinates you? Uh, because we have so many stories that are beloved that come from that time period. It seems to be so rich and, uh, so many intriguing things come out of that time. What is it for you that, uh, that, you know, gets the, the creative wheels turning? Um, I think for me, um, there are several different things. You know, it is the rise of the modern nation state. Um, We see um, Germany and Italy um, coming together as nations. We um, we see the United States really coming on the world stage, as you say, after the Civil War, the Industrial uh, Revolution, the rise in, in women's rights. And and it's 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 the dawn of modernity. I think that's what I like about it. And also um, many of the stories that um, happen in the world in the 20th century get their start then. Um, I think it's an accessible time. Um, you can there's a lot to read about. It. I, I don't know if I could really write about the Tudors. It's so far along. It's so long ago. And we don't have the kind of um, uh, pri- as much primary sources as we have um, in the late 19th century and early 20th century. But having said that, Hank, now I'm also I'm working on another novel um, now about the 70s and 80s, because I think of the, of, of the 20th century, I wanted to write a novel that was closer to my own time. And it's set in the United States. But my historical novels, I think, will always be um, there. I'm going to continue to write a set of historical novels about uh, the family of Queen Victoria and the reverberations that went out um, from from those, uh, you know, those nine children and who they married and what happened to them. So there's a lot more to say. <laughs> but in the yeah. meantime, I'm also plowing another field as well. But um, yeah. it's the early modern quality of that those years that really interests me. Gotcha. Um, there was an interview uh, a week or two ago uh, where someone interview, in, interviewed Vladimir Putin, um, and it's been all over YouTube. If you know you you would have uh, you would have to try very hard to avoid this conversation. And uh, one part of it, uh, he gives the interviewer a history lesson on the, the vast history of Russia and the Russian people. And it's very fascinating to, to see how he kind of counted back the, the clock. And you know, I, I guess his point was to show that Russia had been, um, here a lot longer than most people have a tolerance for, you know, that history is, is very rich. Um, we, being, for, uh, you know, at the vantage point where we are, where uh, a lot of us live through the existence of the Soviet Union, and we don't really know a lot of that Russian history and this this very old society um, that had been there for so long before the, the 20th century version. Um, and so when we think of Russia, we, we think of the Soviet Union because that's what, what we know about. Um, wh- what 
kind of things when you and, and I know that you do uh, vast amounts of research and and really get into the time period and get into the society so that you can accurately tell about it. But what were some things about this interesting society um, that you found fascinating? <laughs> well, as you pointed out at the beginning, uh, Hank, um, you know, there are weird odd echoes um in my novel to the modern to modern day um a situation with the west versus russia putin's mm-hmm. russia russia has always been you know um a vast place and a place that's not truly european it's on the board you know it's on the border of europe and asia it straddles the two continents it's a and place apart yeah you, um, you hear you hear um People say is is Russia east or is it west? Like they've <laughs> always had this this identity. I don't want to say crisis, but they they don't feel like they fit in either place. It seems like no, that's exactly right. And it has ever been thus, you know, for three hundred years as uh, the the West and I include the Americans um, in that we are an extension really of the Anglo right. um, Western culture. Um, we have contr- have to we have all had to confront the other that is Russia. But it's also worth noting that Russia is a magnificent civilization, you know, with its own very um, amazing literary, uh, musical, um, ballet uh, history, and also, of course, the religion, which is um, striking in its um, ornateness and the depth of faith that it, it inspires in its, uh, its followers. Um, However, Russia's political development has always been on um, a different path than the West. You right. can see that Germany and Italy and France and Britain and, you know, even uh, now some of the Eastern European countries are moving in, in, in the same direction. But Russia has never done that. It's always been a place. And even the, the um, dissidents of the current era bewail the fact that it's not been a place where freedom has flourished. And even Russians have been able felt a um, the urge toward uh, freedom. That has not been the highest um, attribute of public life. Um, it's a great, great tragedy what's going on in Russia now. I think we all can agree. Um, but the funny thing is that Putin harks back to the czars and he he self-consciously says that he is a new kind of czar. Um, they would be horrified, the czars themselves, to think that this man... Um, but there are things in common. He is an authoritarian. They were authoritarians. Um, he has early in his career tried to um, resuscitate their reputations. You know, the bodies now of the Romanov family have been completely exhumed and examined and reburied. And they're, they're, um, they're not saints or demi-saints in the church. Um, and yet the issues and the challenges and the drama that is Russia – still exists for us as it did for these German princesses who are thinking, do I dare marry into this family? Do I, do I embrace what is a different world than certainly England where they grew up in part with their, with their grandmother, Queen Victoria and and Germany too. One thing that's fascinating uh, about reading in this time period and about Royal families is um such a foreign concept to us that these um, political marriages and a family from this country marries into a family over here. And um, th- th- that is such a foreign concept, you know, not not only to our 21st century um, minds, but uh, maybe in the television age, um, the that just doesn't it, it doesn't seem to be a necessity today the way it was um, then. What were some of the things that that surprised you um, about this, um, you know, sort of uh, convention that that was so um, adhered to for so long um, that, that yeah. you, we just can't wrap our heads around it, around the no, way that we works. can't. And these these women, um, the woman I wrote, uh, Vicky, who I wrote about my first book and Ella and um, Alex, who are are the, her nieces are essentially our great grandparents, uh, grandmother's ages. And they lived in, but they lived in this caste in this special group of Royal um, families. And um, from an early age, they realized that, 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 that they, 
that the circle in which they could marry was very, very limited. And, and for the most part, they accept this completely. They, they believe themselves to be of a special kind of blood. It's one of the ironies, of course, of my book that the blood disease, hemophilia, is also part of their blood, if you, if you um, broaden the definition. Um, I am interested in how women um, make decisions, um, especially um, when they have very limited um, agency. You know, a lot of historical fiction, which is less historical than mine, the, the women are uh, triumphant, really. They, you know, they battle against the odds and they come out on they they come out on top in some ways. Alex and Ella Hessa didn't. That's not the trajectory that they could follow. They are not um, American <laughs> women in which, you know, these ideas of, of self uh, actualization are so high, but they did have a decision about who they were going to marry within this cast of, 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 of um, their extended family, essentially. And I was fascinated that they really did choose for themselves and that on the, um, to, that pivoting on their choice turned out to be a lot of history that had a great, um, you know, um, consequences for the whole world. So on the one hand, princesses are, you know, looked up at, oh, what a, what, what a wonderful life to be a royal princess. On the other hand, they were had very constricted choices. Mm-hmm. Then, but the choices that they did make are ironically, not ironically, that's the wrong word. The choices that they did make were came from their heart. And yet the consequences of those choices had hard, cold political realities attached to them and consequences um, that came out of those decisions. That that conflict between um, the spiritual and um, the earthly and political um, outcomes really interested me. And I thought other people would be interested. You know, one of the things when you write historical fiction, you want people to be interested. And sometimes when they have a little bit of knowledge already about these characters, they're like, what, yeah, how did Alexandra end up married to Nikki? It's an entry point. And then once you've lured them in with your entry point, you can tell them the story. Right. Um, for, if you're not familiar with uh, the the history of this um, actual occurrence, the, the subtitle of your book, uh, a novel of the last Zarina and her sisters should give you a clue that this doesn't end well. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> like, like, unlike so many tellings of this story, you don't focus on the horrific um, end to all this, but you really spend um, a great deal of care and time in, in showing us how this all got started and what the um, what the realities of life were uh, for these women and for everyone you know surrounding them, um, how did you choose the the um, the kind of window that you gave us to look into this time period and these people, um, and what were some of the choices that you had to make on? Um, you know, what part of the story to tell and how to tell the story? Um, that's such a good question. And, and it really comes to the heart of, you know, constructing a good historical novel, because the thing about a historical novel about the 19th, you know, last years of the 19th century, there's a lot of material. There's a lot of ways the story could go. There are a lot of perspectives you could choose. Um and the hardest part of this book, I knew the arc of the story. I knew what I wanted to where I wanted to land the characters at the end, but I wasn't sure about the path to get them there and how the reader wouldn't be overwhelmed by information that the reader would feel um, entertained at every stage. I was inspired strangely enough um, by little women. Um, As you know, a book about four sisters. This too is a book about four sisters. They're called Victoria, Ella, Irene, and Alex, and they each have personalities the way the girls in Alcott's very famous and beloved novel have. So the thing that distinguished um, the Alcott characters from the princesses of Hesse was that that the princesses of Hesse had no mother. So without the mother, uh, Princess Alice, she died when they were uh, 14, uh, 15, 14, 11, and six. Um, 
without uh, them, they were left to make to their own devices a lot. Their father was very feckless. So this suggested to me that the opening chapter should be the death of the mother, because that's the point of change, right? When does this really kick off the story of these four sisters? When did they be, uh, when was the starting point for the life that they lived? And it was very sadly the death of the mother. And um, then I, um, I really kept to Alex and Ella's points of view mostly because they're the main, they are the Romanoff brides. They're the two people, the two of the four who married into the Romanoff family. But the eldest daughter, eldest sister who's called Victoria is also very important. And she, um, she, people should know is a very significant fact um, person also in British history. She is King Charles's great grandmother. She's a very practical, very assertive. Um, they're the cleverest of the four of them. And she set the pattern in the family in that she married for love. Her cousin, Prince Louis of Mount Batten, called Battenberg at that time. It's no coincidence that Prince William's son, our Prince William's son, is called Louis. The family really began with the marriage of Victoria and um, Prince Louis of Battenberg. Their grandson is Prince Philip Duke of Edinburgh, and their, and of course, their great grandson is the current king. This is an important. Um, and when they exhumed the body of the last Tsarina, they asked um, uh, the Duke of Edinburgh for his DNA, so they could um, uh, they could be certain that this body was his great aunt um, Alexandra. Um, but it's a, you know. I, so I, I framed it as a story of four sisters. I usually kept to the, the point of view of Ella or Alex. But then occasionally, as you saw in the novel, I put in a chapter from other people so that you, the reader, could experience what other people experienced when they met Ella or Alexandra. And one of them is um, uh, Nikki's mistress, uh, the, the dancer Matilda Krasinka. Um, and another one is a, a friend of Nikki's um, who really had doubts about the fitness of Alexander to be the Tsarina at the time of their courtship. Um, but by keeping the novel to essentially 18 episodes, I could move people through the 15 years and all the conflicts that were involved to getting the two women married in a sprightly, but I hope entertaining way. Historical fiction is such an intriguing um, genre uh, because, um, you know, you would hope that the, you know, one of the purposes uh, of historical fiction would be to tell an, a, a historically accurate story. Um, but with the writer taking some liberties to fill in some of the gray areas or some things that were missing, but do it in a way that was consistent with what actually happened in history. Um, I would think that that would be a very difficult um, line to walk sometimes uh, as an author. And, and, and granted with, with this, time period if you do some digging there's a lot of information there that, that can be found um, but then your job as a novelist is to make that uh, information interesting and readable and um, you know, to me that it, it just seems like such a tightrope to walk uh, between um, being a novelist and being true and consistent with the actual history um, the What's what's that like to, to try to have a, a foot in each world? Um, I think it's very important to think of yourself as a hist writer of historical fiction of doing two things. You are um, you are constricted. You are constrained by um, where the, your characters were and what they were doing at any one time. I think it's a sin against historical fiction to put people um, in a place they weren't or have them meet people they never met um, or or speak um, in modern lingo or even um, think in a way that it's a modern mindset. Those are the constraints. But the great thing, Hank, is something a lot of things are taken care of. You know where this story happened. You know essentially how it ends. You know who's involved. Um, and so the guidelines, the, the constraints can also be um, scaffolding. Um, and it's the it's the novelist's job 
to pick the scenes. In that way, also, I think good hysterical fiction is like playwriting because the, the characters come out most um, meaningfully in the scenes. So, and you don't have, you didn't have a tape recorder. Nobody had a tape recorder. So nobody was there to, to tell you exactly what happened in when, you know, Alex and um, Nikki uh, decided to get married. I mean, they did write letters about it, both of them. Um, but it's up to you to write a scene that you believe um uh, conveys the emotion that the reader would have a feeling of being on fly on the wall. And so uh, you have to be true to the way you believe they would talk without using kind of crazy old fashioned language, the way they would talk, the way they would express ideas, the way how they would bounce off each other. Um, and um, also remember that humor and uh, pathos, that's a big part of life. And, you know, these things, nothing, these the people that were writing about, they had no idea what was coming. They, they don't, they're living in their moment just as we're living in art. And so, it, you know, there's a tension between what we all, what we know as readers and what they can't know, but you want to experience the events the way they experience them in, in the running time. I, I do think that's why it's this novel. I did write it all in the present tense because I, I thought there was a lot people already know about these characters and I wanted to evoke the feeling of, but this is how it felt for them when, it, when they knew nothing about what was going to happen to them. Um, so that was a, cho- that's an artistic choice too, within the constraints of fact. Well, this, this story is beautifully rendered. Um, and, and uh, you, you take um, elements that we, we know and, and you give us a little glimpse behind the curtain, which which I think is is uh, exactly what you want good historical fiction to do. The Romanov Brides, a novel of the last Zarina and her sisters is available in two weeks. Uh, we'll put <laughs> links in the show notes where you can pre-order it from Amazon if you want. Or if you have a great local bookstore, go visit them and tell them to pre-order it for you. Support local books anywhere you can. If you don't have a great local bookstore, we will put links in the show notes where you can grab it from Amazon. Um, Claire, uh, thank you so much for coming on the show today and and catching up a little bit from the last time we chatted. It was a great Uh, pleasure, Hank. Anytime. I'll try to write another book so we can meet again. Please do. Please do. Um, For people who, uh, you know, are just discovering you and want to, you know, uh, dig into any news coming up or you know uh, follow along for your back catalog is, is there a place online that's that's yeah best i have a, i have a website where i write about um the historical background of my books and where to read more and i post um essays i've written about the characters it's some sort of um fan site for myself of my own characters and and so please come to claire um for more information about me and i do often speak um on zoom to classes um, about European history or to book clubs. Um, so you can contact me there. Excellent. Thank you so much for joining us today, Claire. It was a great pleasure. Take care. Thanks. That's our episode for today. There's so much more to come as we talk to authors about the craft of writing, but also the business of publishing. Be sure to subscribe to the StoryCraft Cafe podcast in your favorite podcast app so that you never miss an episode. The StoryCraft Cafe is made possible by Dabble. Writing a book is challenging. Your writing tool should not be. Dabble is an easy-to-use online writing tool packed with helpful features that allow beginning novelists and published authors to create amazing stories. Visit us at dabblewriter.com and start your free trial today. Thanks for listening.